so thankful for our worship team and uh, just everyone that has come together to make Sunday morning possible for us. Uh, just to let you know, if you're a first-time guest here, my name's Josh Cribbs. I'm the executive pastor here at the Harbor Worship Center, and uh, just a true honor to be sharing the Word of God in the pulpit today. Uh, I do want to encourage you to uh, continue to please play for our mission team. Uh, Zach Patterson uh, leaned over to me. He said, please pray for the people of Guatemala. And I said, oh, what happened? You know, it was an earthquake. Or... He said, no. He said, my mom and Miss Robin are singing in church this morning, and uh, we want to keep them lifted up. And so the truth is today that they're down there, uh, our senior pastor and his lovely wife, Sister Kelly. And if y'all are tuning in online down there, we love you guys, and uh, uh, I'll I'll be coming to get y'all, but make sure you got your $100 a piece ready for uh, when I pick you up at the airport. Just joking. Uh, we'll be picking the team up. It's just going to be a, today's just going to be a little different, uh, but I promise you at the end of the day, Jesus is going to be lifted up. Amen? But listen, if it is your first Sunday, do us a favor. Please come back next week. Our senior pastor, he's so awesome uh, sharing the gospel that God shows up every Sunday to hear him. Uh, that's pretty good. Uh, and uh, we pray he's here today as well. But, uh, you know, the truth is, he, we're right in the middle of a series called The Afterlife. And uh, I, I asked if I could just do a standalone. I, I didn't even want to get into that. And so he's coming back next week to cap off that uh, Afterlife series. But if you've missed any of that, please log on to our YouTube channel and see what, uh, what that's all about. Uh, it's really about what's going to happen after we die. And so uh, I know that's a big question that a lot of people have. So please do that for us. I want you to lean over to your neighbor. And I want you to say, we got good news. The preacher's fat, so we should be able to get out of here a little earlier. He likes to eat. But guess what? I got to be here for two services. So uh, that don't work out for you. But uh, the truth is, I I've come today to share a message with you. Uh, that, that God's laid on my heart, and uh, I couldn't get away from it. I tried to, uh, but God just continued to, uh, to, to put the word in my heart. And uh, I want you to understand, I need you to be vocally engaged. I need you to say amen. I need you to say oh me. I need you to shout me down, whatever you want to do, because uh, the longer y'all don't say anything, the longer I'm going to go, and uh, my timer you know, uh, I'm just going to extend it. So be vocally engaged today. Amen? Let's try it. There we go. All right. Hey, listen, if nothing else, pastor's li listening online. I want him to at least think y'all are excited. You know what I'm saying? But have, let me ask you this question. Can I, can I do that? Let me, have, you ever, have you ever been had this great expectation of something only to be let down? Anybody? I, I know I have. Uh, and if you haven't, then then you're awesome. But uh, I'm an Arkansas Razorback fan. I know what you, thank you, Dex. Thank you, Dex. I know what you're saying. Boy, why did you even have an expectation? <laughs> the truth is, we got to hold down the number seven spot in the SEC West. That's God's number, and we're holding it down. But listen, I, I, I'm... I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid Razorback fan, and uh, we have been through some horrible things. And just to let y'all know, I'm, I'm entering the fan portal, transfer portal. So uh, there probably will be a, I'll be announcing my new team here shortly. Uh, I just don't see any hope. I doubt that it'll ever turn around. But you know what? We all got those sports teams, and y'all are laughing at me. But I know some Atlanta Braves fans in here today. I heard, that the, I heard that the third base coach for the St. Louis Cardinals had to put ice on his shoulder after the first inning because all he was doing was waving people around to go home. And you know, the truth is we love our sports and uh, we can have these great expectations that things are going to be great. And if you're a Bulldog fan, I'm not even going to go there. I don't want y'all to love me. So. But we can have these great expectations of things, but sometimes we're let down by things. You know, have you ever, have you ever been on Pinterest? How many of y'all in here love Pinterest? All right, let me just let y'all in a word. I'm a guy, and I love my Pinterest. <laughs> y'all, yeah, thank you, thank you. 
You know, you'll be a better husband if you like Pinterest, because then you come home and say, hey, honey, look what I found today. And they're like, oh, yeah, it's beautiful. And then, then you have to create that, and that's where we're going to talk about today. <laughs> is the, I got some pictures for you, and, and if our media team has those, I'd love to show them to you. Uh, so the first one here, uh, if you, no, that's it. Oh, yeah. This is what Ashley tried to make for Kennedy's birthday. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. But, but like, like, that's what it's supposed to look like, and then that's the reality of what you're able to do. Can, can we, do we got another one we want to show you guys? Oh, man. Like, this poor kid probably had ter- like, like nightmares after their mama pulled this out. There's some things that's worth paying money for. Oh, I mean, and I think I got one more, one last one. Listen, my wife and I, sometimes we take pictures, and uh, we have decided not to take pictures of babies. Uh, There's other people out there that's gifted, but that's really what sometimes you want to set out to make these lovely memories, and your kids, when they turn 18, they're going to say, what were you thinking? But the truth is, in all reality, that we've all been let down by something. We've all seen the Pinterest fails. We've, we may, maybe you have some pictures of those things that you, you thought this would be a great idea. I can do this. This seems simple, only to find out that the reality of it was completely different. Amen? You see, the truth is, in our life, we form this idea of what life should look like. We... We form this idea through other people. We, we have friends that have things, and we want those things, and we love those things. And, and so we begin to say, that's what, I, that's what my expectation of life is. Or maybe, maybe it's some past experiences in our life that we've formulated this idea of what our life should be. Or maybe, maybe it's our own desires Maybe, maybe we have some things that we want. And we begin to formulate our idea of our life around those expectations. Only to find out that our lives don't match up to this image most of the time. And it causes us to do something. It causes us to doubt. It causes us to doubt our plan for our life. Amen? Because most of the time, expectation doesn't meet reality. We have an expectation of how things should go, and sometimes it just don't add up. And today, I want to take just a few quick moments, and I want to talk to you, and I want to share with you a message entitled, I Doubt It. I Doubt It. And today, my heart is to present with you just very quickly today is to to present with you three thoughts, three simple thoughts about doubt in our life. And if you have your Bible, I would love for you to turn to John chapter 20, verse 24 through 29. And we're going to read and then we're going to pray over the service today. And I'm just going to share my heart with you. And I'm going to believe that God's going to change some lives in here today. Amen. So if you have your Bible, and if you don't, you can look to the screen. And it simply says this. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with, his, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Verse 28, Thomas said to him, 
my Lord and my God. Verse 29, then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today. God, I pray that you would take me, God, and hide me behind the cross. God, I felt such a burden for this message today. And God, I pray that that burden would be felt through the preached word of God today. God, I pray that at the end of the day, that lives would be changed. God, I pray that if those that have come in here doubting, God would leave believing. And God, we're going to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So I decided to try to wear this jacket to be like a a preacher, but I'm too fat and it's too hot, so we're going to get rid of this thing. So uh, it looked good for a little while, but uh, we're here now. And so let's, uh, let's just, the, the, the expectation was I needed to look like a preacher. The reality is I'm not. So, uh, <laughs> but today I want to I wanna talk to you about three simple thoughts. And after we read that passage, the first thought that I want you to understand today is that we all deal with doubt. We all deal with doubt. In some ways, some shape, some form. I, I, can, I can sympathize with Thomas as he's standing in that room with all of his doubts. Let's, let's roll back and let me take you to a story about two years ago, a real story that I went through. Our first HLA class, we decided to take them to uh, the escape room down in Jacksonville. And we were going to do a team building activity, and we get there, and uh, they begin to divide us up into these rooms, and it was a random pick, but somehow my team, and listen, this is my story, and I'm going to preach it the way I want to preach it, and the rest of these guys can just deal with it, because they're, they're going to tell you a different story, but don't listen, only believe the man of God right now, Amen. So we were there, and they began to divide us up into three teams, and somehow the teams worked out, and team number one was nine, team number two was nine, and team number three was six. I'm going to give you a big guess on what team number three's leader name was. Josh. They began to tell me, well, we've already been here, and we already went in those rooms, so you'll be able to do it. And I'm a competitive dude. I know it would, you wouldn't think that being an Arkansas fan. But I'm competitive. I don't like to lose. As a matter of fact, I almost do everything I can to cheat, not to lose. <laughs> but there's sometimes you just can't cheat. And so we were there in the room, and they took us in there, and I'm thinking to myself, we're already down, but we're going to do it. And we walk into the room, and there's this lady standing in the corner, and she says, hello, my name is such and such, and I'm going to be your helper for today. And I thought to myself, a helper? Listen, helpers are for losers. <laughs> and so she began to tell us what the, what the object of the game and the goal of the game was. And that was that if you've never been to an escape room, you've got to try to figure out all these codes and different things. And, and then you've got to try to put all these numbers together and unlock these things. And then sooner or later, after about a million different things you have to do, you get a key to the door and the door opens. I said, okay, we got this. So we began to work very hard with just my merely six people. We worked very hard. We, we done the best that we could do. But let me stop. I forgot to tell you this part of the story. They told us that the helper is there and she could give you clues. Can you really say you win if you use clues? No. And so there I am, being the fearless leader that I said. I said, team, we can do it. We can do it. We're going to do it without any help. So, 40 minutes in, only halfway through, I began to say, team, let's, let's revisit the strategy. <laughs> and we began to ask for a little bit of help. But the truth was, it was too late. 57 seconds. It's all I needed. But I didn't get it. We was locked in that room. On the outside, I could hear other people celebrating, all nine of them on each team. 
While all six of us were standing there thinking to ourselves, we just went down in defeat. Because we waited to ask for help too late. And the door swung open and everybody there cheering and all this. And there's a picture. And if you don't mind, let's just show them the picture. That right there is the fakest smile that's ever been seen. Right there. We almost escaped. Listen, I had to be a good leader that day because that... Pictures are for winners. We were losers. You don't see pictures of the 28th ranked NFL football team from 2018, do you? No. But I had to be a good leader. I had to salvage the moment. And uh, I was there, and, and you know, there's our team of six that worked so hard, but we came up so short. And I say that story to tell you this, that I can feel myself being just like Peter. I could find myself in a room of doubt, thinking to myself, if I work hard enough, if I, if I solve enough problems, if I know enough things, I can get myself out of this. And I think sometimes in the middle of our doubt, we feel that way. Just like in that escape room, when, I, when the door was locked and there was no way out, Instead of asking for help, I thought to myself, I can work hard enough, I can do enough, I can get enough answers that I'll get over this, and I'll get out of this, and then life will be better. But the difference in the escape room and the doubt in our mind is that there's not a timer, and the door don't just fling open, and we just get to walk out. But the truth is, many of you walked in here today, and you're locked into that room with some of the, with the, some of the same doubts that I have, some of the same doubts as the person sitting next to you, things like, I doubt that I'll ever be a good dad to my two beautiful girls. The weight of being a father sometimes is the most stressful thing in my life. I look at my daughters many times and I don't want to fail them. I don't want to, I don't want to Chase success only to fail my children. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be a great church person only to fail my children. And I doubt sometimes that if I can ever figure it out. I doubt that I'll ever be a good husband. I doubt that I'll ever be the husband my wife needs or that God wants me to be. Listen, there's so much weight that rests upon our shoulders of leading our family like God leads the church. And some days... I doubt it. Some days I doubt that I'll be a good leader. Some days the stress of life looks me in the eyes and the enemy whispers, you won't be able to do it. And I doubt it. And I doubt that, that many of you have those same doubts. That you doubt different things in your life. That you doubt different circumstances. And, and, and this could be a myriad of doubts that you have. But the truth is today, we all deal with doubts. Amen? Some of the greatest people in this word doubted God. I, I'm reminded of Moses as, as he was standing there by that burning bush. And God speaks out to him and says, Moses, I've heard the oppression of my people. And I want you to lead my people out. And he says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring in the Israelites out of Egypt? Because the doubt came flooding in, even though God had faith in him. I'm reminded of Elijah. Elijah called fire down from heaven and, and killed all the prophets of Baal. And then he, he gets a Facebook message from Jezebel, and it says, hey, Hey, bro, I don't know what you, what you think you were doing killing all our people, but I'm about to kill you. And he takes off running, and, and, and he begins to leave where, where he's at, and the, he gets himself in the middle of, a, of the wilderness is what the Word of God says, and he sits down by a tree, and he just says, God, kill me, please. Kill me. How can we sometimes go from the mountaintops to the valley? And so fast, because the enemy wants to destroy us. The enemy, 
wants to take us out. And there's, there's Elijah laying under this tree saying, kill me. And, and, and we can just see the power of God upon his life. You see, this book is filled with people that doubted it, both large, large on large scale and, and some on small scales. But can I give you to the thought today? If you're breathing, you're going to deal with doubt. It's common to all men and women. Which today brings me to the second thought. The second thought is how does doubt develop? So we all know we deal with it, but how does it start in our life? How's it developed? And if you have your Bible, I, I want to I just read this passage to you, and then I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kind of dissect it real quick. And it comes out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 7. It says, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach into their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered him, Go and tell John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. In verse 7, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. Where did you go into the what did you go in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind and I want you to come to I want you to understand this story today I want to give you a little context John is there in, in, in that prison and he begins to ask himself is, is Jesus Christ the one come on John you, you baptized Jesus what do you mean is he the one can I tell you that sometimes in our life doubt is formed when the enemy can isolate us when he can get us pulled away from where we need to be, that's when he can begin to work on our mind. And see, John there, tucked away into this prison, tucked away where there's no communication, there's no way out, and the enemy begins to beat on him and beat on him and beat on him. And he's saying, you know what, if, you, if he's really the one, John, do you think you should be here? If he's really the one, do, do you think that, that you should be in this situation, in this place? And I think if we're not careful, we don't, we don't use the eyes of God to see the schemes of the enemy. Because his thing is, he just wants to isolate you. He begins to say, let me put a little distance between you and the word of God. Doubt starts in a place called busy. I, I, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. If I can just put a little distance between you and the church. Hey, man, you don't need the church. You're good. You don't need other people encouraging you and, and lifting you up. You know, they're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites anyways. Why do why you need to do that? And the enemy, he'll begin to tell you, it's okay, just, just sleep in today. Don't worry about the house of God. You know what? You're, you're doing good. Slowly, slowly. Doubt starts when we're isolated. I know maybe, maybe you're doubting me, but, but just think about this. Eve was in the garden that day by herself, separated from Adam. And the enemy began to say, just doubt it. Don't you doubt it? Don't you doubt what God's saying, and when we start to doubt, it makes sin look okay. You see, that's why I believe the shepherd is always willing to leave the 99 for the one. I believe that's why he understands that the 99, listen, I don't have to be with them right now. They're going to be able to protect their self right now. But that one, that one that's running out there by himself, in just a moment, the enemy, once he gets him out away from the pack, he's going to take him out. And it's just like many of us, we find ourselves, we find ourselves being distant. We find ourselves being separated. You know, things like the, the, the enemy begins to lie and he'll tell you, hey, you're the only one facing this. You're the only one going through that situation. Nobody else is going to understand because the enemy wants you to feel like you're the only one. But the truth is, 
God's got another plan for us. Not only will he isolate us, but he'll, he'll make our circumstances look way worse than they are. You see, John's circumstances was very difficult. Not only was he in prison, but he was isolated from the ministry that God had called him to do in that time. And that was to be the front runner. That was to one to make the way in the wilderness. And sometimes the enemy will come around you and he'll be able to, he'll start whispering in your ear. He'll start saying things like, does, does, does God really love you? Does, does he really love you if you're here? Does, do, you, do you really think he loves you, that, that, that your boss passed you up on the promotion for the third time? Do you really think a loving God would do that to you? And then we begin to balance out that thing, my expectations versus my reality. And we begin to ask ourselves, if, if he does love me, why am I dealing with this? Why am I continually dealing with this? You see... If I, if, if he, he'll whisper, if he really cares, then why are you, why is your marriage still suffering? Why are you still battling this sin every day? Why are you still going through this? And he'll begin to make you look around and your circumstances seem dire. And I know today that my heart is to, to share with you this message that I pray would ultimately free you from this doubt that's caused by the enemy. And if he don't do that, he'd, he'll use rejection. He'll use things like failures. He'll begin to bring up old sins. He'll begin to, he'll begin to ask you, you know, what, who do you think you are? That you, you, do, you remind, do you remember who you've done and how bad you were? And you think that, that God's going to use you and, and he's going to do great things in your life? Because that's what he does. You see, I, I'm, I'm reminded of this story. And Adam, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm reminded of this story. In 1 Samuel 17. And David was sent by his dad down to the battlefield where Goliath was. And he gets there and his oldest brother Eliab, he says, what are you doing here? Who do you think you are? And David says, what, what is your problem? Can I, can I just say a something? And then, <laughs> this is good stuff. And then it says, David turned away and started talking to somebody else. Because when the enemy comes to accuse you, you got to learn to turn. When he becomes to tell you that you can't do it, that you're nobody, that, that you, why are you even here? What makes you think you can make a difference? You got to learn to turn and say, I ain't got no time for that. And the scripture says that Saul began to hear what he was saying. The enemy wants to distract you. He wants to reject you. He wants to accuse you. And today, the last and final thought that I have is, how is doubt defeated? I believe today that we must understand what Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens and the earth, for the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see... We always don't understand God. And we may never. But we've got to learn a few things. Number one, we've got to acknowledge our doubts. Both John and Thomas said, hey, I'm going to be honest. I've got some problems. i got some doubts in my mind. And I need, you, I, need you to, I need you to help me out. But not only do we have to acknowledge our doubts, I believe we must understand this. God doesn't always live up to our expectation, but he always lives up to his word. Amen. It might not make sense for us. Why am I in prison? Why am I isolated? Why is my marriage failing? Why is this sin that I keep 
I kept trying to get over. I keep trying to get over. Why does it keep coming back up? Even time I come to the altar and I lay it down, God, why? Is it just me? Do I have a problem? And we begin to ask these questions, and, and sometimes we don't have the answers. But understand this, that here is the answers to all of our problems that we have. His word will not change. His word is everlasting from cover to cover. And in our lives, we will ask the question many times that we don't have answers to. But God will always live up to his word. And I believe the last thing as you stand to your feet is this. You've got to recognize that faith is not a feeling. It's a choice. You see, today, you may be in a valley, and on the mountaintops, it's a lot easier to have faith. But in the valley, our feelings begin to whisper doubts in our mind. And I believe the only way we'll overcome doubt is that we understand that Maybe I don't feel like it today, but I'm going to pray. Maybe I, I don't feel like it today, but I'm going to be in service. I'm going to be around people that love me. I'm going to be around people that care for me. I'm going to be around people that, that they'll, they'll be willing to speak into my life when I need them to. I don't feel like celebrating the success of other people, but my faith, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I know, God, that my blessing is on the other side of me celebrating those people. And I want you to understand today that I believe God still believes in you. What the passage said was as John's disciples began to go back to him, it said that Jesus began to speak of John, that he was the greatest man ever born to a, to a woman, that he, was, that he was still doing the will of God. And I believe what John was saying, and I believe what the disciples, maybe when they got back to him and said, John, I know you're doubting him, but he still believes in you, buddy. I know you're in a difficult situation. You're in a difficult place. Nobody understands it right now, but he still believes in you, John. He still believes that your greatest days are still to be had. He still believes in you, buddy. And so many of you today, you need to hear that, that he still believes in you. He still believes in you. They might have walked out on you. They might have told you you couldn't do it, but he still believes in you. And as we close today, I want to go back to Thomas locked in that room. There Thomas was, just a few days prior, his savior, his friend, his mentor, his leader, had been taken away from him. His situation was dire, his circumstances were horrible, and he was isolated. And he began to doubt some things. There he was, doubting, standing in that room as all of the other disciples began to say, John, began to say, Thomas, you know what? He was here, but you wasn't. And he said, I know y'all got to see him, but I, I'm sorry. I've got my doubts about it. I've got some things going on in my life that I just don't understand right now. And in that moment, there come Jesus. Eight days later, he came. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We serve a Savior that he ain't stopped by no locked door. The scripture says he walked through the wall. So he don't have to have permission to come into your situation and your doubt today. But I believe, I believe if you'll do what I didn't do in that room and you'll ask for his help, you can get out of it today. Because I believe that when he walked into that room, he stuck out his hands and he said, hey, hey, Thomas, feel this. 
feel this because I know if you'll feel my pain, I can heal yours. I can heal yours. And I don't know what you came in here with today, but I just want to open these altars up because I feel the presence of Almighty God in this place. And maybe you walked in here with some doubts that you didn't understand. Maybe you walked in here with some questions you didn't have answers to. But I believe that God is saying, if you'll just ask me, if you'll just ask me, I'll come in there and I'll answer them for him. I know the expectation is not going to meet your reality right now. But if you'll just believe me, i got something greater for you. If you're here today with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you, is that you today? It's no long, drawn-out altar call. It's simply this. Today, would you be willing to say, i got some doubts and I need God to step in. I need Him to intervene today. I need His answer. I know I doubted it when I walked in, but I want to believe knowing that God's got the best for me when I walk out of these doors. If that's you here, as soon as I say amen, I want you to step out of your seat, make it to this one. And I believe people are going to come and they're going to pray for you because some of them have been in the same situation you're at today. He walked past all the other people that believed and he went to the one person that didn't believe in that room. And he said, Thomas, touch it. Touch it right now. And I believe that's what he's saying to you today. And I ask you right now, if you step out of your seat and move, Jesus, I pray right now, touch the heart of your people. God, if they come in here with doubt, I pray that they would be free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If that's you, I want you to step to this altar. I want you to step to this altar. I know what you're thinking. Nobody else is going to step. But I know some of you came in here with doubt today. The Holy Spirit brought me in here on Thursday. And I was weeping in this altar because I knew some people was going to come in here today. But I don't always have the answers, but he does. I'm going to ask you, leaders, if you'd step in. Pastor Adam would sing something. I just want to pray for you today. 